In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden. I also serve St. Luke's Covington and Trinity St. John Lutheran School in Nashville. Thank you for tuning in to our Bible class. Today we continue our study of the book of Acts. We'll be looking at chapter 10 and part of chapter 11. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In telling the history of the Christian Church, Acts chapter 10 is very important, as we will see. It shows like never before that the life that Christ earned is intended for the whole world. So let's get right to it. Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now recall that when we left Peter at the end of chapter 9, he had gone down from Jerusalem to Lydda, where he healed a paralyzed man named Aeneas, and then he was summoned to Joppa on the Mediterranean coast because Dorcas, also known as Tabitha, had died. He raised her from the dead. These miracles were performed in the name of the Lord Jesus and confirmed the word of God that Peter and the other apostles were preaching and teaching. In Joppa, Peter is staying with a tanner named Simon. And notice that God is in control here. It's the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus, who is leading and governing the church. Now, through the leading of God, Peter will go to work still further north along the Mediterranean on the coast in the city of Caesarea, in the home of a Roman soldier named Cornelius. This man had come to believe in the true God, although he may not yet have taken the step of formally joining the Jewish faith through the rite of circumcision and so forth. But he was offering up many prayers and gave alms to aid the Jewish people. God decides to bless this man with a vision that would lead to a gospel presentation by Peter. And isn't it interesting that the role of the angel here in this vision is simply to set up the meeting. The angel doesn't do the preaching himself. God is so wonderful and so gracious that he gives sinners, fellow sinners, the privilege of telling all that Jesus has done for us. In fact, in his first letter, Peter says that the things of the gospel, the truths of the sufferings and glory of Christ, which were predicted by the prophets and were proclaimed to the readers of Paul's letter, they are the things into which angels long to look as though the angels are standing on their tippy toes, craning their necks to try to understand this great love that God has through his Son for sinners. Not even angels have experienced the unmerited grace of God as we have. And it is ours to tell to the people who need to hear. Let's go on. Verse 9 of Acts chapter 10. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. 
But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call uncommon. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up! I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter, he is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner, by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So what is going on here? While praying up on a rooftop in Joppa, Peter sees a vision of something like a great sheet being lowered from heaven by its four corners, Looking at it closely, he sees animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. The voice of the Lord told him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. In other words, go to it, Peter. Butcher something here for yourself. But Peter was horrified. By no means, Lord. No way. Nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. All his life, Peter had been careful not to eat the food that was unclean. Only certain species were eligible for the people of Israel to eat. For example, pork was not among the clean meat. You could read in Leviticus chapter 11 about the beasts, the birds, the living creatures that move in the water, and the creatures that swarm on the ground that were permissible for food and those that were not. To this day, strict Jews keep a kosher diet and will not eat the foods that were restricted before Christ came. Now this was all part of the dramatic ways in which God distinguished between his people Israel and between the other nations of the world. But the Lord Jesus had brought an end to the restrictions of the ceremonial laws by fulfilling the entire law of God. Paul describes it in Colossians chapter 2 when he says that Christ canceled the legal demands of the law, setting them aside by nailing to the cross the debt of these laws. And he says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Those ceremonies were a shadow of Christ and what he would accomplish for his people. A shadow resembles the real thing and leads up to it, but it is not the real thing. The substance belongs to Christ. 
Therefore Christ answered Peter, What God has made clean do not call common, that is, unholy. Christ was canceling the dietary laws and making all foods clean or acceptable for consumption by God's people, to be received with joy and thanksgiving from the hand of God. This is a tremendous freedom into which Christ has called us. That means if you have ham or pork chops in the oven, enjoy them. Give thanks to God for providing you with good tasting, nourishing meat, and thank him for his son that has freed you from having to keep a kosher kitchen. Along with that, rejoice that Christ has freed us from the rules about circumcision, about the sacrifices. He has transformed the commandment about the Sabbath day, the day of rest, from an ordinary requirement prohibiting physical labor into a command that we gladly hear the word of God and so find true rest in the Savior Jesus Christ, who did all the work to rescue us from sin, death, hell, and the power of the devil, so that we might rest in his forgiveness and in the ascended Lord receive the gift of eternal life. This was all very new to Peter, who had lived his whole life under those restrictions. Previously, he would never have gone into the home of a non-Jew. But now he says, God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. It's a whole new era. Our righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ, which covers our guilt. Let's hear a song about that called The Robe of Righteousness, sung by the ongoing ambassadors for Christ. So the table has been set. Peter is now ready to speak. Let's go on with Acts 10, verse 34 and following. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. 
And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So the good news continues. This life that Christ brought to the world carries with it no distinction among persons. That is to say, it was for Jews and Gentiles alike. We can't imagine today what a radical idea that was for Peter and the other apostles. They had been brought up making all kinds of distinctions all the time between Jews and Gentiles. And remember that all the believers in the Lord Jesus about whom we have read so far in Acts chapters 1 to 9 were all Jews. How much better the world and even the church would be if we could not only believe but also fully live out this idea that there is no distinction among persons before God. It doesn't matter about race or background, male or female, rich or poor. It brings to mind Romans chapter 3 where we read, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from law. Although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, that is, an atoning sacrifice by his blood to be received by faith. And there's more. Continuing now with verse 44 of Acts 10. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So the Lord demonstrated that salvation is for all people. He demonstrates it to Peter and to those of the circumcision party, so-called, by pouring out the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit on Gentile believers just as it happened to Jewish believers in Christ on the first Christian Pentecost. Remember, all those people gathered in Jerusalem that day, the first Pentecost, they were Jewish believers. This is really the third Pentecost-type experience we've seen. There was Acts 2, 50 days after Jesus rose. There, there was Acts 8, when Peter and John went down to the Samaritans and laid their hands on them, and people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now the Gentiles at large in Caesarea, still further from Jerusalem, experience these same gifts from God, whereby God confirms that this gathering of believers is also a first-rate church, every bit as much as the church in Jerusalem. Naturally, they are also baptized into Christ like the others. Friends, we cannot overemphasize how important this is for you and for me, because we are Gentiles. We are not of the bloodline of the people of Israel. We have not kept the Jewish faith. And yet God has opened up salvation also to us. We were once far off, but now we have been brought near in the blood of Christ. Once we were nobodies, but now we're the people of God. Why, we live halfway around the world from where these events occurred. We live hundreds of years later. And yet Christ's gifts are ours here and now, and our life with Christ is every bit as real as was theirs. And just as Peter learned not to make distinctions between people, we are called to make no distinctions today. God wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why we thank God for every opportunity in southern Illinois and around the nation and the world to reach out with the gospel of Jesus, even to those who seem to us as unlikely to accept it. We may think that, oh, they're not like us, they'll never believe. But we scatter the seed widely and generously and let God do his work with it. 
All people are stubborn and resist, but God is able to work faith in any and every human being. God wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, there was some fallout in Jerusalem over what Peter had done down in Caesarea along the coast. Let's read on into chapter 11 and see how Peter answers. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Well, you can see that they in the early church had their share of conflicts, just like we do. Peter was accused of doing wrong by going into the home of Gentiles and having a meal with them. But the conflict was settled as Peter told them what had happened. He showed them that God was not only canceling the distinctions about food, but he was also canceling the distinctions among people. In the home of this Gentile, Cornelius, he said, God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Later in the great council of the apostles, called to settle these matters once for all, recorded in Acts 15, we read that Peter will say, God made no distinction between us, that is the Jews, and them, the Gentiles, having cleansed their hearts by faith. No, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Peter also points out the great testimony of the miraculous presence of the Holy Spirit. He says, The Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Peter's testimony carries the day. The group heard these things and fell silent. They glorified God, saying then to the Gentiles also, Wow! God has granted repentance that leads to life. This life that Christ earned for the world comes through the preaching of repentance. The book of Acts is all about people coming and going, being sent here and there. They are following the mandate of Jesus Christ, who said that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Luke 24. 
The result of this preaching was, as the group in Jerusalem put it, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. You see, it's all in the manner of gift. Repentance is a turning from sin to the mercy of God in Christ. It's a turning, a change of mind and heart that only God can produce in us. And he does so preached by the word of law and gospel from the mouths of fellow sinners. God wants to produce that turning in the whole human race. And of this, Paul wrote to the Romans, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Romans 10. The word that Peter brought to Cornelius is described as a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. If we cannot go ourselves, we can surely be a part of the senders. Friends, in the eternal scheme of things, we cannot overestimate the value of the mission outreach we do. Sometimes we tend to think of it as doing our duty, like paying some sort of tax. But this is a joy and a privilege to be part of God's eternal plan to bring life and salvation in Christ to all nations. There's nothing that you or I do that is more important. Here's a song about that called Hark the Voice of Jesus Crying, sung by the ongoing ambassadors for Christ. Hark the voice of Jesus crying, who will go and work today? Fields are white and harvest waiting, who will bear the sheaves away? Now let's pray the prayer our Lord taught us, led in song by the children of Trinity St. John Lutheran School. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden. This is Pastor Tim Miller. 
Next Sunday, God willing, we'll continue our study in the middle of the book of Acts chapter 11. Please join us at 9.30 a.m. on WNSV 104.7. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to join with us sinners at St. John's to hear the word of Jesus, forgiveness, and salvation. Saturday evenings at 6.30 or Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, now worshiping in the church building. Thanks for listening. Thanks to our sponsors from St. John's. Stay tuned for worship from our sister congregation, Trinity Lutheran Church, Nashville.